The people in charge of the Fukushima Daiichi plant are reporting another setback. They had been preparing to begin work this month to build an ice wall around the damaged reactor buildings. But the project has become delayed and will start next month instead. Officials with Tokyo Electric Power Company plan to freeze about one and a half kilometers of underground soil around the reactor buildings. They hope the barrier will keep groundwater from becoming contaminated by radioactive substances inside. Officials said the project fell behind schedule after two workers died in January in accidents. They say they don't know when the wall will be finished. TEPCO still needs to get permission from nuclear regulators for some sections of the project. Company officials have disclosed that they need more time to complete another task. Workers have been processing 600,000 tons of contaminated water stored in tanks at the plant. TEPCO had hoped to finish the work by the end of May. Now they say it will take several more months to deal with an estimated 20,000 tons of water. Two of Japan's nuclear power plant operators will decide if three aging reactors should be scrapped. It could be the first reactors, with the exception of Fukushima Daiichi, to be dismantled since the 2011 nuclear disaster. The directors of Kansai Electric Power Company have discussed decommissioning two at their Mihama plant in Fukui Prefecture. They will shortly meet with the governor to inform him of their decision. Japan Atomic Power Company is considering pulling the plug on one of the Tsuruga facility in the same prefecture. All three reactors are at least 40 years old. After the accident at Fukushima Daiichi four years ago, the government limited nuclear reactors to a 40-year lifespan unless they meet tougher safety standards. Officials at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry have been urging operators to decide what to do with reactors that have already passed that age. The reactors have a relatively small output and the power company executives have suggested they can't justify the expense of upgrading to meet the new safety requirements. Now, Chugoku Electric Power Company and Kyushu Electric Power Company are expected later this week to decide if two dated structures should be torn down. Currently, all of Japan's commercial nuclear reactors remain. The huge earthquake and tsunami that pummeled Japan's northeast region four years ago devastated local businesses. Seafood processors, one of the region's key industries, were hit especially hard. About 80% of the small and medium-sized seafood processors along the coast say sales are still below pre-disaster levels. Some are fighting their way back on the global market. NHK World's Keiko Aso has more. Ishinomaki in Miyagi Prefecture was hit by a tsunami of over 8 meters. Houses and shops along the coast were swept away. Fish processing was almost wiped out in some parts. 40% of the seafood processors that stood on the coast are still closed. Even the plants that have struggled back on their feet face serious challenges. This farm processes oysters, scallops, seaweed, and other products. It lost its factory in the tsunami, but reopened two months later in a makeshift building. Yasushi Kotono is in charge of sales at the company. He was dismayed to find that some pre-disaster customers started buying seafood from other areas while his company was on its knees. I don't think supermarkets can turn their backs on producers that helped them out while they couldn't get produce from us. The lack of Japanese customers has forced Kotono's <laughs> company to seek new business opportunities overseas. His small company has a limited lineup of products and it doesn't have the brand power of its bigger rivals. So Kotono has built up a business consortium with five local seafood processors. By working together, they can now sell Kotono's oysters and scallops, as well as their grilled mackerel and smoked yellowtail. Over 100 items in all. The shift didn't come cheap. To be competitive overseas, Kotono's company invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in a new refrigeration system. The new system freezes food instantly. It protects the taste of food by not destroying the cells during the freezing process. 
So Koto Uno's products keep their flavor. With its expanded product lineup and new refrigeration system in place, the consortium has launched sales abroad. In February, Koto Uno met with officials from a Taiwanese food import company. He brought with him six processed products, including oysters and salmon. He says the frozen oysters stay fresh and delicious even after six months. The technology gives Kotono the competitive edge. I tasted his oysters today, and they're really good. I'm sure this is going to be a very popular and essential item in our restaurant. We have the processing technique to preserve the natural flavor of the food. I hope I can take advantage of Japan's great freezing technology to offer delicious foods that can be enjoyed in all seasons. Kotono and his partners are exporting to five regions and countries, including Hong Kong and Singapore. They are aiming to double the consortium's exports. Disaster officials from around the world have been meeting in the Japanese city of Sendai, where they've been studying Japan's experiences following the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. They agreed on the need to expand and improve international tsunami warning systems. The officials are gathered for the UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction. They agreed on making the improvements after hearing a presentation by Noritake Nishide, Director General of the Japan Meteorological Agency. Nishide told the audience his colleagues had underestimated the height of the 2011 tsunami because at the time they were unable to make an accurate calculation of the magnitude of the earthquake. Nishida said despite their best efforts, the disaster resulted in 20,000 people dead or missing. He explained that the agency has since enhanced its monitoring system and network so that future megaquakes can be measured more precisely. Japan's warning system has also been improved, with more emphasis on evacuating residents when the scale of a quake or tsunami is still unclear.
delegates to a UN conference on disaster risk reduction in Japan are gaining first-hand knowledge about the March 2011 earthquake and tsunami. A tour of the host city Sendai showed participants how people are using what they learned to prepare for future disasters. NHK World's Kurando Tago reports. About 25 representatives from Europe and Asia took part in a study tour on Sunday. They got a close-up look at how the disaster affected Sendai and how people there have responded. Svatra Jayaraj is from Malaysia and Desley Amor Hasinto is from the Philippines. They are working for international NGOs. They saw an elementary school damaged by the tsunami. An official from the city explained the scope of the destruction. These are aerial photos of Arahama taken before and after the disaster. The tsunami waves washed away everything. He said more than 300 children fled to the school's roof where they waited until rescuers arrived. You can't imagine um, what they went through then. Jacinto said seeing the students' photos made her think of disasters that have affected people in her country. I can remember also the, the disasters the Philippines have been through and the young people. In this area, the tsunami traveled nearly four kilometers inland from the coast. Participants heard about how the people are working to lessen the damage of future disasters. Officials are taking measures such as building a coastal levee and elevating roads. They've also constructed an evacuation tower that stands 10 meters tall. <laughs> it has a slope so people in wheelchairs can use it. Excellent. Local residents shared stories. The houses in this area were not destroyed by the tsunami, but they were flooded by a meter and a half of water or more. We evacuated to the junior high school. I think nearly 1,600 people were evacuated at that time. The Philippines has also um, have experienced a lot of disasters and natural calamities. You never know what, when it will happen. So we always need to be prepared. The tour offered participants ideas on how people in their countries can get ready. We haven't thought of this uh, thing yet, so I think this is one of um, things that I can share when I go back. We have to build back better because um, uh, that is the only way that we are going to survive. Build extra resilience of the community and actually empower the community uh, in their daily lives. Jacinto and Jairaj say they plan to share what they learned. They hope lessons from Japan will help inspire people back home to take fresh look at disaster preparation. Grand Otago, NHK World, Sendai.